It's better sound for my recording. No. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, I want to introduce Mr. Justin Lekuman, and he's the first present presenter. <coughs> and uh, many of you heard Koi. No? But if you see, probably you can recognize, and there was a picture over there. And he is really the expert of that. And uh, the, he wanted to talk about the Koi for a long time at the Capstone project, and it was very hard to kind of uh, formulate what to do because not there, there are so many experts in that area, even in, even in Japan. But he was also an exchange student for one year. Uh, there was an exchange program go going on here at CSMB and then opening in Japan. And he was there for one year and he also had a good chance to, to work with his father who is also the expert of the koi. So he's going to share his, uh, I think, new knowledge that probably you gained uh, through uh, this capstone project. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Lickerman, and I will be doing my capstone presentation on uh, koi, Japanese ornamental carp. And just a warning, I'm very bad at public speaking, so if I start to mumble or ramble, then let me know and I'll get back on course. All right, uh, to start off, the table of contents. All right, uh, the reasons why I started doing this topic and such is that my first real experience with koi was when my father built a koi pond at our house uh, about eight years ago now. And it was one of my first real introductions to Japanese culture and uh, one of the one of the things that started me down the road to get me where I am today and being a Japanese major, going to Japan and such. Uh, uh, research questions. First off, what are koi? Uh, what relevancy do koi have to Japanese culture? Uh, why are koi such why are koi such a hobby? And what are the differences in uh, thought about koi between uh, Japanese and uh, foreign uh, hobbyists? And to research this topic, I looked through magazines and did interviews with uh, with koi experts and koi hobbyists, both running running the range from amateurs who have only been uh, interested in it for just a year or two to people who have been doing it for 30 years of their lives or more. Okay, uh, what are koi? Koi are basically just normal, run-of-the-mill carp. They, they're not uh, native to Japan. They were brought to the country about 2,000 years ago. Uh, the exact date isn't really known, but it's estimated 2,000 by, uh, by merchants from the Asian continent. And they were brought over as a food supply and were kept for mainly farmers up in the rice growing areas to have a stable food when uh, during the winter when there wasn't anything to harvest and they had to find food where they could. They were especially useful for the rice farmers because if 
you have koi in a separate pond from where you keep the, where you're growing the rice. You can use not only the fish themselves for food because they grow to very large size, they have very good longevity, and they reproduce like crazy, leave, uh, making about 3,000 baby koi in each spawn. So, given just their uh, endurability, they were very useful to the rice farmers. And also, the byproduct of any living creature uh, was used to uh, was used in the rice fields themselves. Uh, koi waste matter is very high in uh, a, chemical, a chemical called nitrates, which are basically plant food. But it was about 200 years ago that the first changes in koi were noticed. Uh, before then, koi were usually just a single color, uh, nothing too flattering, a very dingy brownish black, uh, occasionally white, but mostly just this sort of ugly brownish black color. However, they started noticing that there were red koi, which they hadn't seen before. So some farmers took these koi and put them in separate ponds. And as they found new different colors that were cropping up, they put them in with them and started crossbreeding them. So from those beginning mutations of the color patterns of koi, the modern uh, classifications started to arise. And the patterns, the patterns are mainly what's changed in the last 200 years. Uh, as you can see in some of the pictures through most of the time, first came uh, a mixture of red and, red and white called a kohaku, followed by the uh, uh, taisho sanke and the uh, showa sho, uh, sanshoku, which both of those, uh, aside, both of those are um, a white, black, and red fish, such as the one in the left there. All right, for Japanese, a relevancy to Japanese culture. Uh, like most things in Japan, a lot of their relevancy came from China. In China, there was a legend about a koi that, or about a river in uh, China that had a very large, steep, and treacherous waterfall on it. So if a koi could climb up this waterfall, swim up it, then it would become a dragon. And you can see the picture of the tattoo on the upper right is a uh, stylized representation of Koi jumping up a waterfall. So because of this legend, Koi began to represent uh, strength, uh, determination, and uh, courage. And they're seen on the uh, Japanese holiday Children's Day they fly uh, carp streamers called koinobori uh, that represent members of the household and the hope is sort of to have the family take after these traits of the, of the koi. And another example of their uh, relevancy to the culture is baseball. In Japan, baseball is Ex taken extremely seriously. It's one of the top two sports aside from soccer. Now Hiroshima's team is the Hiroshima Carp. So for a team to even consider naming themselves after uh, what's basically a dim-witted fish that just waits to be fed all day, there would have to be some serious uh, cultural relevancy to prompt that uh, name. And also, there is, or koi were used as a, um, a folk remedy, and most specifically the blood of koi. Drinking about two tablespoons of a koi's blood when it was freshly killed was supposed to be a remedy against pneumonia. And also, the fish oil, or the liver oil from uh, the koi, 
is very beneficial to the body's immune system and contains lots of vitamins and is just generally good. So Koi have had a lot of it's had an interesting role in Japanese culture. Uh, so now we get to koi for hobbyists. Now the the price of a koi or the worth of a koi is all up to pattern. And there are 13 classifications of, uh, of what koi are, or in what classifications they fall into. And they all have strict rules that they uh, follow as to where certain <laughs> color patterns may lie on the body, what the uh, overall body shape must be, how thick the black on the body must be, how bright the white, how deep the red. Uh, it can get really difficult to uh, start pricing these if you haven't had a long uh, experience working with fish or working with koi. And koi are kept in ponds. Obviously, they're fish; they need water to survive. But they're either kept in uh, in hobbyist ponds, which are made of concrete and kept at houses, or mud ponds for breeders. And there are specific advantages and disadvantages to each of them. Uh, with the mud ponds, the mud ponds give less stress to the fish, so their pattern will come out more. A fish is, or koi's uh, pattern is all related to uh, its metabolism, or not its metabolism, its basic body workings. When there's anything that threatens the fish, or if it feels a change in environment, or pH balance, uh, mineral content in the water, stress, anything, it will stop producing color and its, uh, its pattern will start to fade out and it will just become a bland looking fish. So with mud ponds, it's much easier for them to hide. They're usually about an acre or more in uh, total space, so there's much more space for the fish to branch out and it keeps the fish in overall good health. But such mud ponds are not really applicable for most hobbyists because first of all they want to see the fish that they've spent lots of money on, which I'll get to price in a second. And yeah, that's the main thing, just be able to see the fish. Uh, tournaments. Tournaments are for the serious koi collector. Now, the pictures here on the bottom are grand champion winning fish. These are fish that have been judged as the best in their either the entire country of Japan or a prefecture or regional tournament. <coughs> this one on the right here is currently priced at $250,000. And even if offered that amount of money, it probably wouldn't even be sold. So, with Japanese fish, they're a lot like dogs. They have pedigrees. It goes back in bloodlines to the original, uh, the original uh, occurrences of the patterns. So, for this one on the right, uh, was referred to as a kohaku. It can be traced back to. Uh, back through generations to fish that originally popped up about 150 years ago. And it is possible to get grand champion quality fish out of just normal breedings, but with the pedigreed ones, it's much more of a certainty. So not only are you buying a fish for $250,000 that's a tournament winning fish and just an outstanding fish for your pond, you're also building, or you're also buying a potential uh, money maker, which if you can get it to uh, breed properly and have the skill to sort out among the 300,000 babies, uh, which ones are, which of the about 100 have the potential to become a grand champion, then you could start making money. 
but that's a difficult thing because if you're going to be working uh, as a koi breeder and seller, koi are like any animal. They're susceptible to viruses, bacteria, things that can kill them. Uh, especially viruses because koi's immune systems shut down at about 50 degrees uh, Fahrenheit in the water. However, bacteria and uh, parasites are still active until 40 degrees. So in the winter, early spring, late fall, they're highly susceptible to diseases and in some cases, one of the uh, people I talked to uh, in researching this, a uh, man named uh, Takeda Kazuo, he lost his entire business, 300 or 3,000 fish, uh, a large investment in a matter of days because of a virus that swept through his pond and went bankrupt. So it's a very volatile business. Uh, this was a survey I did of uh, asking people about what they thought of koi and things like what their favorite types were, how much a year they spent on fish, um, what meaning fish held to them personally. And these are the research questions themselves. Oh, gonna end up soon. Uh, and it's when did you start getting an interest in koi? Uh, what was the reason for you uh, of getting that interest or getting into that hobby? What's your favorite type? Uh, the overwhelming one I found was, well, that's not it, A was the Kohaku, the one that was selling for $250,000. It's, it's the standard, it, what everyone thinks of usually when they think of koi is that certain fish, the white with the red sort of step pattern on its back. And amongst all the people I interviewed, that was usually what they said as their favorite fish or their favorite type. And to the interviewee, what meaning do koi have? And this varied a lot. Uh, one of the people I interviewed, uh, after the death of his grandfather, he needed something to, to help him uh, in sort of healing his heart. And that's one of the effects that koi have, which is a bit difficult to believe that, you know, a fish can <coughs> sort of help make things right. But watching koi swim and seeing them moving about the pond and just the overall beauty of the fish themselves, the surroundings, it's very tranquil and it's very conducive to meditation, self-reflection, just overall stress relief and you get a very nice feeling just being out there. It's sort of like it's taking a step away from just how busy life can be and how much stress can be put on you and you can just sit and watch the fish swim for hours and not even notice time passing. Uh, how, much, how much do you spend on koi a year? This one varied a lot. <laughs> uh, the littlest sum I heard was about a thousand dollars. And koi are expensive depending on what you buy. You can get koi from anywhere between five for twenty dollars to one for two hundred fifty thousand. But for a decent looking fish that is very pleasing to the eye, uh, falls into a category and is just a re really nice fish to have swimming around, it'll usually be about between a hundred, three hundred dollars depending on size. Usually the hundred dollar ones will be about this big, three hundred, about that big. Very expensive. <laughs> how they make money. Uh, and the most I heard was over $200,000 a year. And this was a dentist uh, in Southern California who uh, is a major koi keeper and keeps nothing but fish that are capable of winning a tournament. And finally, what is the secret to koi's popularity? That answer was all over the place. <laughs> because 
no two, no, pe no two people are going to agree or going to have the same opinions. It'll always be something varying. There'll be some personal reason that they'll have for becoming interested in Koi or for liking them. It's, it's like with anything. Uh, I believe I already discussed this. Uh, to foreigners, uh, what the foreigners' opinions of Koi. And it's Koi are peaceful. They bring about feelings of peace and tranquility. Uh, sitting by the pond will, it helps bring out memories. You'll reflect back and it's good for stress relief. Uh, and the bottom one is a quote from uh, one of the people I interviewed. And it's Koi is a hobby that holds peace, that holds peace, uh, tranquility. Uh, and today's so today's society is very fast-paced. Uh, or for people who, uh, as people who feel that uh, today's society is too fast-paced, people who get interested in Koi for their soothing effects will also grow. Uh, and Japanese attitudes. The top one is a quote that I got from uh, one of the coin magazines that I brought over on the table over there where the man is talking about how he built his pond in a way to, or as, in an attempt to try to recapture the memories of his youth when he was a little boy playing in a river with fish. And it's quite a moving passage, but I couldn't accurately translate and bring it justice. Uh, and to the Japanese, the pond, it's, the pond itself is not the most important thing. It's the overall garden. Uh, the koi pond is part of a garden that has landscaping, uh, trees, stone statues, uh, all kinds of things around it. And it's the overall effect of the overall effect of the koi, the pond, the waterfall, the trees, everything around it that is uh, that brings about the feelings of peace and tranquility. Uh, koi, koi is a hobby that can be can, uh, that can be enjoyed by anyone. Well if they have enough money to build a pond and buy fish. But if you're willing to put in that kind of investment, then it's anyone can get enjoyment out of it. And in these hectic times, a feeling of peace and, and uh, serenity is very important. And that's why koi, I feel, are so popular.